Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Passive Income Through Multifamily Real Estate podcast. I'm your co-host, Lolita, also joined by Kyle. Joining us today on the show, Gene Trowbridge. Gene, thanks for joining us today. How's it going? It's going great today. Thank you very much. Good. Well, here's a little bit about Jean. Jean is a California licensed attorney, real estate broker, and author. His book on real estate syndication titled It's a Whole New Business has sold over 4,000 copies. Jean has conducted a number of highly regarded intensive workshops for real estate syndicators, teaching them how to legally raise money from private investors. In addition, Gene and his partners provide securities offerings, documents, and advice for seeking to do Regulation D, 506 offerings, crowdfunding offerings, Regulation A offerings, and public offerings. So that intro doesn't do you justice, Gene. So why don't you tell our <laughs> listeners a little bit more about yourself and what you currently do? Well, I thought you did well. Thanks so <laughs> much. I uh, appreciate that. Um, in a more folksy approach. I was, I was a commercial real estate uh, broker, and then I became a syndicator. I really didn't know what I was doing when I started that. I became a syndicator and started buying properties with my friends. And then I went off really to uh, make a career in that. So if I can say I've had two 20-year two careers, one was as a broker and a syndicator. Primarily, we did um, storage facilities. We built self-storage facilities in the Inland Empire of uh, Southern California. And then when I was 45, I went to law school. I guess I didn't have enough to do, right? So I went to law school and passed the bar. And so for the last uh, 25 years, I've been an attorney practicing in, uh, in the real estate securities, uh, securities area. Now we have a, a firm and uh, Jillian Sedoti, my partner, uh, does a lot of Regulation A work, and the whole firm does uh, Regulation D work. Uh, real estate is our primary business, but we do a lot of different things. Jillian has done offerings for racehorses, uh, energy products, the dreaded cannabis offerings. Yes, we've done that too. So uh, uh, it's uh, private placements. You know, private placements is a big business, and we're all over that business. Perfect. Thank you for sharing that. So people often get the term syndication and securities confused. Can you please explain the difference between them and what each is? Yes, I can. Uh, two different things. A syndication is just simply when people get together and pool their money. Um, GoFundMe is a syndication. Uh, going to the movies and watching all the companies that are on the screen at the beginning of the movie just tells you that uh, companies pool their resources and their expertise and their management to get something done. So that's just simply what a syndication is, two or more people pooling their money to do, uh, to do something. But what a security is, that's a term of law. A security is uh, something that you invest in that has a certain set of uh, criteria and uh, the government has set rules to uh, protect people who invest in securities. A syndication isn't always a security. I said, go fund me is a syndication, but it's not a security because no one is expecting to share in the business venture. Uh, in a security, it's a group of investors investing in a common enterprise where they're expecting to earn a profit from the business and someone else is going to manage it. So that's the difference. A security has to do with the business and syndication can be anything. I mean, you jump on an airplane and fly somewhere. That's a syndication. You, you don't own a plane. You're not a pilot. So you and 140 of your best closest friends get on an airplane and get somewhere. That's a syndication. Got it. So we're surrounded by syndications, it sounds yeah. like. Almost everything we do. You know, every time you go and look at a piece of commercial real estate and it's owned by an entity, there's been a syndication. Right. Right. Okay. So 
why is it or is it important for passive investors to educate themselves on securities law if they intend on investing in multifamily? I'm not so sure it's important that they're, they're knowledgeable about the law, but in the definition of a security, it says that the results are going to be driven by the promoter or the sponsor. So that's what the investor needs to know is when they look at a document and the document is what they're going to sign to evidence their investment in in, in the offering, in the syndication, uh, they should read who's going to make the decisions. Are the investors going to make decisions or are all the decisions going to be made strictly by the, the sponsor? I think that's the number, the number one thing. And then we'll get into the question, who is the sponsor? Does the passive investor know enough to do research on, on who the sponsor is? is? Hopefully there's more than one person in the sponsor group, and uh, that's really it. The, the documents that you're handed to invest in something that is risen to the level of a security, uh, one of the documents would be the operating agreement, and the passive investor should read the operating agreement because that's the rules, the rules of the game, and that's how everyone's going to be expected to play. Okay. And you mentioned earlier that the securities law is there to protect the passive investor. Absolutely. How does it protect the passive investor? Uh, two things it does. Number one, uh, because there are two major securities laws. The first security law says you have to give the passive investor full disclosure, all the material facts necessary so that the passive investor can learn about those facts prior to investing and then be able to make an informed decision. So the first rule is disclosure. The second rule is licensing. Uh, you can't sell a security of someone else's unless you have a license issued by the government. And the background checks and the work to go and get a license is, is quite extensive. So they're protecting what the investor buys by requiring full disclosure and they're protecting the investor from fraudulent people who are selling uh, those documents through the licensing uh, situation. Got it. Okay. Can you explain a little bit about the documentation limited partners will receive when um, investing in an offering? Well, yes, the, uh, there's really three documents that a, an investor would get. And whether it's a limited partner or today, I would say it's a little more common to be a member in an LLC. They're basically the same thing. It's just the entity is different, named differently. But the documents you get would be one, the disclosure document. And my feeling about the disclosure document is it tells the story. Some people call it the private placement memorandum the PPM, but that's too broad a term because the PPM really encompasses all three documents and the private placement memorandum is all three. But the first of the three is a disclosure document. It tells the whole story. What about the investment? What about the property? What about the people? How's the money going to be shared? Uh, what's the track record? If there's a track record of the, in, of the sponsor, how do we deal with the disputes? How do we vote? How do we have liquidity? It, it tells the whole, the whole story. And then once the story is told, the next document the investor would find is the operating agreement, which is the rules. If we say that money is going to be split a certain way on operations, that's fine to say in the disclosure document, but the operating agreement comes and it's a legal document that everyone signs and says, okay, we all now know this is what the sponsor or the manager is going to do with the cash and it lays it out and all the rules are uh, are in there and that's a document that is has to be read and acknowledged by all parties ppm is just a document hopefully you read it the passive would never sign the ppm sponsor signs the ppm but the operating agreement the investor signs and then the third document is what's called the subscription booklet and the subscription agreement is kind of the passive investor's 
offer to the sponsor that, hey, I'd like to invest $50,000 in your deal. And then it goes through um, some more disclosures. Yes, I've read all the documents. And yes, I'm telling you I'm accredited. And yes, I'm telling you I'm sophisticated. And then in support of my offer to buy part of uh, the offering from the sponsor, I'm going to be asked, the passive's going to be asked to fill out a questionnaire. And the questionnaire is going to be backup for the statements I made in my offering that I'm accredited or I'm sophisticated. And it's going to uh, uh, give the sponsor more information about the investor so the sponsor can make a determination whether the investor is suitable for this particular particular offering. For example, if I'm 70 years old. If you were gonna do an offering that had a 10 year hold, um, you'd want a question, and, and I was thinking about investing in my IRA, you'd wanna question me, how am I gonna be able to deal with the mandatory withdrawals in, in my IRA because this investment is illiquid. You're not gonna get it from there. Right. Invest, Gene, don't invest all your money in this in this fund. If you have to invest all your money and you're not going to be able to make your withdrawals, then you're not suitable. So that's one of the things that I see as important in today's world in the offering questionnaire. So three documents, the disclosure document, the operating agreement, and the subscription booklet. Put them all together and let's call it a PPM. Let's call it Perfect. a placement memorandum. And this may seem obvious, but we do not want to give any money to the sponsor before reading or signing this document, correct? That's correct. And the sponsor doesn't want to take any money uh, before that because the operating agreement will say, we've gone and we've opened a bank account. And the bank account is owned by the company. And we have... Uh, We've obtained a, a tax ID number. We've opened the bank account. You're going to write your check to the bank account that's owned by the company, not to the sponsor, but to the company. Okay. So if someone is trying to collect money prior to giving those documents to you, then obviously that could be a red flag or probably is a red flag. It is a red flag as far as the passives mm -hmm. go. And, and, you know, I represent the sponsors and if anyone is out there doing that, that's uh, that's very dangerous. The, the securities laws, you know, are, are it is a criminal statute. So if you're going to co-mingle, doesn't that sound like a bad word? If you're going to take Indeed. investors' money and put it in your own bank account, that's co-mingling. Well, you go to jail for that. Yep. Okay. So earlier I asked you about uh, LPs or limited partners. Can you explain the difference between an LP limited partner and a GP general partner? Yes. Uh, in a limited partnership, there have to be two members. One member is going to make the decision and one member isn't. It's as simple as that. In a limited partnership, there's a general partner who makes all the, all the decisions and there's a limited partner who can't make any decisions. The general partner has total liability for anything that goes wrong and the limited partner has limited liability. So that's what's going on in a limited partnership. There's a general and there's a limited. In an LLC, in a limited liability company, you still have to have two people. One is called the managing member and one is just simply called the member. And the difference between the two entities is really in a limited liability company, the manager, the managing member, even though they make all the decisions or can make all the decisions, has a limited liability. They're protected by the entity structure of an LLC, where they're not as a general partner. And in an LLC, we can allow the members to vote and take an active part in management without losing their liability protection. And the limited liability company is the newest of these two entities. And the reason it came about uh, in the early 80s is to facilitate capital formation by giving the, the boss liability protection and by giving the investors the ability to vote. 
So we would do, you know, 98 out of 100 offerings we do are limited liability companies today. Got it. So depending on the type of offering, some require an investor to be an accredited investor. Can you define accredited investor and also talk about um, other titles such as sophisticated? Sure, I can. Uh, <laughs> and I'm actually prepared to read you. Uh oh, you know, sophisticated. I is it is it a, that in depth? About forty words. So okay. let's talk about what the issue is here. The issue is the security law is all about protecting investors. Okay protecting the investors. And uh, the securities world can't protect everyone. They can't look at every offering. They can't look at every document. So when the uh, securities laws were formed, they created something called Regulation D. And Regulation D says, hey, there's a whole bunch of people out there that don't need our protection. They're rich, they're smart, they can read the documents themselves, they can ask their own question, and we don't need to protect them. So that's the private placement world that we're in. And somewhere along the line, they needed to come up with a definition of who is rich, okay? So they created this definition, it really goes back to 1981. You're accredited, you're rich, if your net worth is a million dollars or more, not including your personal residence or you're rich if your annual earnings as a, an individual uh, single filing taxpayer is $200,000 a year and has been for a couple years, and married filing jointly $300,000 and has been for a couple years. So those are the people that the government said, we're not gonna protect them because by definition, we decided they're rich and we probably think they're smart. Okay, so that's the rich and smart group of people. So real so, quick on that one, sorry to interrupt you. How long has that um, been in place? Has that been since 1981 that those numbers for an accredited yes. investor has been in place? Yes, and that's one of the problem with those numbers. In 1981, a million dollars meant something. Right, well, that's what I was just gonna say. So do you think that that will ever change or is there a way that that could change? The Jobs Act uh, that came out in 13, 2013, looked into that and the SEC took comments and they decided initially all they're going to do is have it, uh, have those numbers uh, every five years accelerate by inflation. Right. Okay. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's minimal, minimal. So that is, that is an issue. Yes, you hit, you hit that. Now, somewhere along the line, they decided, well, there are a lot of other people who would like to invest who might not be accredited? And can we do something for them uh, other than have them only invest in fully registered, fully public offerings on the New York Stock Exchange? So they came up with this term and they added the term a sophisticated investor. Let's say for example, um, I'm talking to a lady who wants to invest, uh, she has an, $900,000 in the bank. She uh, earns $195,000 a year. She's not accredited. What does she do? She does analysis for real estate investment trusts on Wall Street <laughs> every day. But she can't invest because she's not accredited. So they came up with the category of sophisticated and everyone asked that question. Can you define sophisticated? Well, no, I can't, but they did. Okay. Perfect. Sophisticated investor is one who alone or with the help of a purchaser representative like a registered investment advisor, an attorney, CPA, or by reason of their own educational, business, or financial experience can be reasonably assumed to have the capacity to understand the fundamental aspects and merits of an investment in the company. So they're smart, either on their own or with others, they're smart enough before they invest to understand, to ask questions, 
and make a determination if this investment is suitable to them. And then that's why the sponsor has the offering questionnaire. Because I might check the box and say I'm sophisticated, but am I? So the sponsor now has uh, an obligation really to protect himself and the other, other investors to see uh, what questions our investor can answer. Have they invested in real estate before? Are they in the stock market? What's their education? What did they do for their job? And then the sponsor has every right to look at that questionnaire and decide, no, that investor uh, should not be in this deal because this deal's too risky. We're building, we're building a church on spec, okay? And uh, that may never come off, so maybe we better not take this investor in the deal. Right. So when a passive investor is looking at a specific offering, what are the top three questions they should be asking themselves from the your number perspective? The one question you should ask is, who's the sponsor and what is the sponsor's plan for continuity? You came to me and you said, Lolita, you came to me and you said, Gene, will you look at this offering for me? I probably wouldn't because that really isn't my job, but I'd ask you these three questions. Number one, who's the sponsor? And if you said to me, it's Gene Trowbridge, it's an individual, I'd say don't invest because you give Gene your $50,000, what happens if something happens to Gene? There's got to be a continuity plan. There's got to be a Lolita and a Kyle together in the manager entity, right? Mm -hmm. So that there's continuity. There's got to be at least uh, two people. When I was a syndicator, I used an S corporation as the uh, managing member because the corporation goes on forever and ever. And there were a couple of shareholders. They didn't have anything to do with the business. But if I died, they could go out and hire someone new and the entity wouldn't end. An individual, an LLC with one member dissolves immediately by an act of law if that member dies. So now we're where are the investors that are stuck? Number one. Number two, hey, Gene, have you done this before? That's a good question. Has the sponsor done this before? And every sponsor has had to answer no to that question once. But you want a sponsor probably who said, yes, I have. Well, if it's, is it one or is it 40? Okay, so you can dig a little deeper into that. And then the third question I'd ask is, uh, if this deal's good enough, Gene, are you investing any of your own money in it? They don't have to invest much, but I think they should invest, uh, they should invest something. There's a million questions to ask, but those are the first three I could ask or your listeners could ask before they've even read the documents. Those are three great questions asked, but the overwhelming question is, what's the plan for continuity? The fourth question is, will there be a plan for my liquidity? If I'm going to invest as a passive, will your documents have a plan that if I need, I can get my money out? And, and they'd, have to, they'd have to know their documents well enough to answer that, yes or no. Got it. And so going back to number one, what if you do go with this single individual sponsor, he, pa he or she passes away, is there any thing that you can do to protect yourself at that point? No. It, it just no, because if that person is the manager, as an individual and the manager's gone, the documents probably say that the manager can sign the loan documents, the manager can write checks, you know, it's all. Uh, so then is the only option foreclosure on the property? Uh, there wouldn't necessarily be a foreclosure on the property. Uh, now we're talking about what does the lender think if there's no manager anymore who signed on the mortgage? That could be the right for the lender to foreclose. But I, I'm painting a grayer picture than it probably is. There should be something in the document that the investors can replace the manager for cause. And one of the things for cause would be if the manager's dead, the manager disappeared. So then who's gonna do that? Who is gonna right. do that? How are you gonna pay them? Uh, and I have been the replacement manager in, in six different funds over the years, and only one was there a, a death. 
there's been divorces, there's been bankruptcies, there's been flat out disappearances. Uh, one sponsor hit his head skiing and came out a quadriplegic. Wow. <laughs> and these were all individual people running you know, millions of dollars of investors. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden there was no one to do it. So it, it creates some heartburn amongst the investors. Got it. Now that's great advice. Perfect. Well, Lolita is going to take us into our final four questions. All right, Jane, are you ready? I am ready. All right. So what is the one tool that you've used in real estate investing that you say you could not do without? The tool is my education in the financial world. Um, I came out of school as an accounting uh, major out of college as an accounting major. And then I went off relatively quickly into the world of commercial real estate and took CCIM classes and uh, certified commercial investment member classes offered by the NAR. And uh, I took those classes, I became an instructor, and I just finished my 40th year as a senior instructor with CCIM. And that was the one tool that uh, really did it. I, I learned all the basics, and then I was forced to keep up with my education through all these years. So that was the number the number one, uh, the number one tool. Great. Can you tell us a story about your biggest mistake in real in real estate investing, and what is the main takeaway for our listeners? My biggest mistake would would be based on the fact that I was a sponsor. I was offering deals. <clears throat> the mistake turned out to be that I thought I always had to have a deal always had to have a deal on the street. I was selling my offerings to the stock brokerage community, to the registered investment advisors, certified financial planners and stock brokers. And there was a conference coming up in Anaheim. It was actually the national conference for the International Society of Certified Financial Planners. And by God, I didn't have an offer. And my competitors did. And I knew if I went to that conference and I stood there and I had a booth and I didn't have an offering, my clients would go to someone else, Mm -hmm. someone else's offering. And then I don't know if I'd ever get them back. So I jumped the gun and I took an offering to the market before I had done my, uh, my full, uh, realm uh, realm of disclosure documents and it turned out to be a bad deal so uh, as a sponsor that's my uh, that's my uh, my mistake all right um what is it that you need to do now to grow your life to the next level oh (laughs) okay so i'm 70 not interested in retiring I have a wonderful wife. Kids are grown on their own. There's the two of us. I guess the thing I need to do now to make my life be better is to make sure that every day with Kay and with working, I can get to the end of the day and say, you know, there's not that many of these left. Did I do the right thing with this day in my family environment? How's that for on my sleeve? That's amazing advice. I think everyone should take it no matter what their age. I yeah, love that. I Thank you. I was going to say. All right, Dean. And finally, where can people find out more about you? The best place would be to go to my company's website. And uh, the name, of, uh, we market under Crowd Lawyer. What? No, we don't. We market under Crowd Funding Lawyers. So <laughs> it's Crowd Funding Lawyers. .net. Perfect. Crowdfundinglawyers.net and, and you can find out about me and you can contact me there. My email would just simply be gene at crowdfundinglawyers.net. Great stuff. Gene, you're always such a delight to talk to. So thank you for making something that you need to be alert and uh, vigilant about sound simpler than it's thought out to be. So really appreciate it. And thanks for being on the show. Well, I appreciate you too. I'll see you soon. Bye. Sounds good. Thanks, Gene.